I just knew in that moment that as a human being, I had to do what I had to do. I didn't even stop to think. I just had to get those bodies out of there. Her eyes were open, staring at me, looking at me. I couldn't tell what was going on. It doesn't matter if it's a stranger or someone you've known all your life. Human instinct kicks in and you just know you have a job to do. Welcome to Extraordinary Stories Podcast. Hey, how are you? Are you well? Are you good? I am. So, here we are. Now, before I carry on, I would like to publicly address (laughs) the volume issues in the last episode. I'm sorry about that. I was recording in a new place, I was editing in a new place, I know it's no excuse but please forgive me for um, that issue but also know that I am rectifying that issue so uh, the episode will be put up again with the volume issues corrected. Yeah, sorry about that. I hate when that sort of thing happens, it's just so annoying. I was wondering... Uh, maybe it's because I'm thinking of my, uh, well, do you know what I, would, what I would love to do? I'd love to do a sleep podcast. I think that's going to be my 2019 goal, is to do a sleep-based podcast. Maybe I was starting to get into my whispery voice, starting to get into my <laughs> low, soft voice. I don't know what was happening there. Anyway, it will be fixed. All right, couple of quick Shout outs and then on with the episode. So, first shout out. Well, I saw something tonight on Facebook about shout outs, and I'm going to fix the issue with what I saw. Someone who had received a shout out in another episode was saying just how lovely it was to have it when another listener commented this. I've been listening since day one and I've never had a shout out. Well, that is until now. Dana Biggs, hello to you. Hello, Dana, hello. I am so sorry I've never done a shout out for you up until now. I hope that you are well and I hope that you enjoy hearing this. And I hope that I said Dana correctly. Because when I first looked at it, I was like, could it be Dana? Dana, 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 Dana. I was in that whole world. So, uh, yeah, I'm really hoping (laughs) that one of those is correct. And uh, thank you for listening. Susan Absinthe McNutt. Hello to you. Hello, Susan. Thank you for the stories. Thank you. Hello, Shelby Davis. Shelby's new to the podcast. Thanks for listening. And the last one goes to Paul Strutt. Paul got married this year and he now has the new surname Strutt, which I love. How great a surname is that? It sounds like, I'm gonna strut down the street. Oh, it's so, it's so fierce. I love it. 
So Paul is getting his second shout out. I mean, there's uh, there's poor uh, <clears throat> Dana Dana, who actually never even got one in the first place. And Paul, you're on your second. But he's getting his second shout out because, well, he's worth it. And because he's got a new surname. So, hey Paul, keep strutting. <laughs> no, that is so shit. <laughs> keep strutting. That's actual pesh. <laughs> I think sometimes I should just learn to slap myself for my shit jokes. Anyway, that is shout outs over. Okay. So, there are three stories in this episode. And they're all based around what would you do for a stranger? Okay, are you ready? Let's go. All right, it's 2013, and we are in North Devon in England, a beautiful part of England. Lots of countryside. Oh, it's just your, Devon's your very picturesque kind of England. It's all rolling hills and greenery and forests. Very, very nice. So there is a woman named Jo Stuart Smith and she is, she's heading back from a nearby town where she had been visiting a friend. Now, where Jo lived with her husband and her daughter was kind of the middle of nowhere. So they had a train station, which was fairly near them, but it meant that if they were going anywhere, they'd have to drive to the train station, drop the car off, get the train into the nearest, biggest town or city, and when they came back, you would need a car to to get to where Jo and her family lived. So she had been out for the day, and what happened was she had come back home, she had got to the train station, She got in a car and she was just heading home. Now, it was winter at this point and it was freeze your nipples off (laughs) cold. It was freezing. So she just wanted to get home. So Jo is about 38 years old. A busy working mum. Looking after her family. And so she just wants to get home to her house. So, she jumps in the car. Now, it's not a terribly long, long journey. I mean, a good maybe 20 minutes or so. It's a bit out of the way. So, Jo is driving home through the country roads. And as she goes, she passes like a river, she passes by some some forest area. It's a really, it's, a, it's like I said, it's a little bit isolated. So Jo knows these roads, as you tend to do when you're driving the same things all the time. And as she's driving home, she sees something which is just a little bit odd. She sees a parked car parked at the side of the road. And when she looks a little bit closer as she's passing, she sees that there is a young female in the driver's seat of the car. Now, okay, not necessarily odd. A young woman has stopped her car at the side of the road. Okay, might not be that odd. What made Jo take a second look is that the window of the car was rolled down and the young female, who Jo guessed was about maybe 21, 22, her head was out of the car window 
and her hair was covering her face. So the girl had like long, long hair. And her head was kind of like bobbing up and down. And to Joe, it just looked a bit like... <laughs> and it's a strange way to describe it. And I swear to God, your honour, this has never been me. <laughs> but you know when someone's like really drunk and they can't they can't actually control their head. Do you know that thing where like their head just keeps lolling all the time, their head just keeps kind of keeps like falling forward. Well that was what was happening. So Joe's looking at her and she thinks, Oh this girl's head is like out of this car window and it like her head keeps falling forward. So Thinking, well, maybe is she drunk? I, I don't really know. Joe decides she's going to stop her car and she's just going to go over and just check that the check that the girl's all right. So as Joe gets out of her own car, she takes her phone out of her pocket because she thinks I might need to call an ambulance here, or I might need to call police. So obviously, I want to be able to give them all of the proper information. So she gets to the car. And when she gets there, the young woman is no longer slumped out of the window. Instead, she's sitting upright and she's looking right at Joe. She's just staring right at her. Eyes wide open, she's just looking at her. So these two strangers are just looking at each other and Joe says hi listen I stopped my car to check that you're okay are you I I think I should call for help because you look like you might need help and the woman says no don't I'm absolutely fine but there's something about the stare in this girl's eyes that puts Joe on edge and she thinks something is not right here something is not right so Joe kind of persists with it she says look I, I don't want to come across like looking like I'm interfering I don't know you but I'm concerned something's not right and she takes her phone out again and she is about to call the number for police or ambulance and the girl shouts at her no I'm fine. I stopped here to listen to some music in my car in peace. I'm absolutely fine. So Joe, she just backs away from the situation. She says, okay, if you are sure, then, then I'll go. I'll be on my merry way. So Joe gets back into her car. She drives away. And as she drives away, she's looking in the rearview mirror and she sees that the girl's head is once more doing that thing where it's like dropping forward all the time out of the window. Now the whole entire drive home, Joe cannot shake the weird feeling that she has. She's got that niggling, you know that like weird, niggly, something is not right kind of instinct that you get. I've said it a billion times, it's your inner animal telling you something isn't right. Something's speaking to you and saying to you, something's not right, go and sort it. So the day, right, the day goes on for Jo, she's at home. And there's a point a little later where she needs to pop out um, in her car to pick up her daughter from somewhere. And she decides that once she's collected her daughter, she's just going to take a little detour because she can't stop thinking about this girl in the car. She thinks, I'm just going to take a tiny little detour past where the car was and just check if the car is still there because she just can't quite get it out of her head. And when she passes that same spot, the car is still 
there. So she pulls up, she parks, and she crosses to the car. Now, in her head, <laughs> she's doing that thing that, <laughs> you know that thing, we all do it. We all do it all the time. You're, like, you're already having the conversation that you think you're about to have, the, <laughs> the one that you think you're going to walk into. So in Joe's head, she's going, I'm just going to say to her, look, I think I need to call police. Some, you don't look well, something looks wrong, or whatever. So she's got all this. As she crosses to the car, she's like, I'm just going to say to her, look, you're not well, I'm going to call police, blah, 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 whatever. But as she approaches the car, she sees the car engine is running and the car is empty. Now, as soon as she had seen that the engine was running, she thought, shit, this girl is trying to gas herself to death. Or this is like she's brought herself here to kill herself in some way. Or this is like I'm interrupting someone's suicide. But then she gets to the car and the girl's not there. She's not anywhere around. So Jo goes back to her own car. She gets her daughter out and she says to her daughter, look, just start shouting really loudly. I know we don't know this woman's name. I know we don't know who she is. Just start shouting and let's see if we get any kind of reply. So Jo and her daughter, they're standing there and they're shouting into the distance. But bear in mind, I did say this is like a sort of country road middle of nowhere kind of area so they're just basically shouting into hills and into like vast areas of land and of course nothing comes back all that they can actually hear is their own voice echoing back so joe's now in a bit of a panic and so she jumps in the car and she speeds home to her house and her husband is in the house. Now, she hasn't seen her husband all day. She hasn't told him about the mysterious woman. So, I mean, she must have just sounded... <laughs> she must have sounded like a mad woman <laughs> rambling about, well, I saw this girl in a car and then I went back and then she's not there and blah, 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 whatever. But her husband's like, okay, yeah, this sounds peculiar to me. Let's go and check it out. So what Joe and her husband do is they leave the daughter in the house and they head back to where the abandoned car is. When they get there, Joe's husband checks the car over and he says, well look, it's running absolutely fine. If this woman had wanted to get somewhere, if she'd wanted to drive somewhere, then she could have. So why she's just left her car behind and left it running is a mystery. That is, of course, if we're assuming that she left the car voluntarily. Did she? Did someone take her from the car? Who knows? These are these are questions that Joe and her husband can't answer in that moment. They decide to do a search of the car and what they come across is a piece of paper with an address on it. Now the address is a farm that's not too far away from where they are. They sort of recognise the postcode on it as not being too far from their house. So they think, well okay, is that where she was going? Is that is is that what her destination was? I know, let's let's go there. So they drive to this destination written on the piece of paper and they've no idea what to expect when they're going to get there. I'm just going to say at this moment how much does all of this sound like <laughs> the plot of a horror movie? I mean like not a good horror movie. I'm talking like one of your low rent really, really <laughs> low budget shit horror movies. <laughs> like girl in a car, then she vanishes, then a mysterious address. I mean, it all just sounds like some weird horror movie. There's that, um, 
what's that? Uh, what's her that used to be in Disney? Yeah, she used to be in the Disney stuff and all that, and then she like took loads of drugs and went nuts. Lindsay Lohan, Lindsay Lohan. There's an absolutely awful, terrible. I oh my god, I can't, it was years ago I watched it. The terrible Lindsay Lohan horror movie, where I'm sure she's like a stripper or a pole dancer or something, and it is called something stupid like. I know my murderer killed me last Saturday night or something. It's called something ludicrous like that. But that's the kind of like low budget horror movie that, that, that this is uh, making me think of. Anyway, Joe and her husband, they get to the farm and this is what they find. The farm, the address that they have found in this car that farm is completely abandoned. No one lives in that farm. It's pitch black. So why did that girl have the address? The girl who's now vanished. Why did she have that address? I'm telling you, horror movie vibes. <laughs> Lindsay Lohan is about to turn up any minute and start stripping. <laughs> so Joe and her husband, they decide, right, we're going to have to call police. This has gotten really weird now and they need police help. This is what I think is really interesting here, right, and we'll, you know, as we go on in this episode, we'll talk about stranger intervention in things. And this has gone from, you know, Jo saw someone by the side of the road that she thought, hmm, that girl looks like she might need a bit of help, that doesn't look right. And it's progressed very quickly into, they're now involved in something that's way bigger than just there's someone at the side of the road who looks like they need help. And I love that. I love that kind of like, I think, yeah, I think it's what we should all do for each other. I think we should all try to, you know, if you see someone in trouble, help them. But this is, I just mean, for Joe and for her husband, this must have been a very crazy few hours because they've gone from, okay, random girl by the side of the road, now we're calling police. What's happening? Police advise Joe and her husband that they should just go home and that if anything where to turn up, they'll be notified by police. I'd be livid at that point. I'd be like, excuse me, uh, I think you'll find I'm actually a part of this story. I'm actually quite involved in this story so far. So don't tell me to go home, Mr. Police Officer. I want the story. Anyway, that's what they do. They offer, actually, Joe and her husband so kindly, they say, look, we'll keep searching. We'll keep looking. But police are like, no, no, you might compromise things. Just let us do it. Just you go home. <sighs> Raging. Two hours pass and they hear nothing. So they call police to say, look, has anything turned up? Has anything happened? And police say, yes, something has happened. We've now started a large search of the area using dogs and 30 different police officers. So at least police were sitting up and paying attention. It reaches midnight, nearly 12 hours after Joe first encountered the woman in the car. When Joe's phone rings at home and it's police. They say they found a match to the description of a missing woman matching the one that Joe gave and matching the car. And they ask this, could Joe and her husband go and do a search of their land just in case she had wandered into an outbuilding nearby or fallen down in a field, fallen into a pond, could they go and check? 
Now, they agree to do this. But remember, it's midnight. It's pitch black. So they get their torches. And they go and they search. And they look, but they can see no sign of this woman from the car. So they call back police and police say, okay, new strategy. This is just, (laughs) I think this is not police work at its finest. I'm not going to lie. I don't think this is great police work. (laughs) Police say, okay, can we ask you then to go to your neighbouring farms and ask them if they will move their animals into outbuildings so that we can have a very thorough check of all the fields. Now, I'm no farmer. And that may come as a surprise. <laughs> that I am not a farmer. <laughs> but even as I even as a non farmer, I don't really think waking up loads of cows and loads of sheep in the middle of the night is a particularly great thing to be doing, is it? I would not want to be the person who has to go and, like, wake up hundreds of cows. But anyway, police, that's what they want. They want the land clear so that they can search. Now, the neighbours, the farmers, they're grumpy about it. Well, you know, be grumpy about it all you want. Farmer, Bill, whatever your name is, I don't even know what his name is, I'm just making that up. Farmer, whoever... But there's someone missing. You know, there's a girl in the area missing. Just get on with it. So police come. They look. It's now 3am in the morning and there is nothing. No sight of her. In all of the madness of the police checks, police are still sort of walking around the area nearby Joe's house. And Joe decides at one point, do you know what, I'm just going to go with a police officer and I'm just going to have a look down the roads that they're walking down. I'll just go down with them. So they walk about ten minutes away from Joe's house. Joe, at this point, she cannot get the image of this girl's staring eyes at her in the car from earlier, out of her brain. She just can't shake it. She just cannot forget the girl's wide eyes looking at her. So Joe's walking with a policeman, and about ten minutes passes, and they get to a bit in the street where Joe goes one way, and the police officer goes a separate way, and they they go to look in different places. As she's passing by the river, Jo looks down and she sees something floating. Now at first she's not sure what it is. It's 4am by now and so the light, it could be playing tricks. But no, Jo is sure of it. The thing in the river that she's looking at is the same woman from the car earlier on and she's floating on her back with her eyes open. Jo screams for the police to come and help. What Jo also does here is brilliant. She just doesn't hesitate for a second. She takes off her jacket, she dives into the river and she drags the woman to the bank. Now, the woman is still alive, but just, just alive. She's breathing, her eyes are wide open, but she's severely suffering from hypothermia. So Jo puts her jacket around her and the police officer arrives and they huddle together to try and keep her warm 
and the police officer calls for an air ambulance to rescue the woman. Joe waits with her until she's taken away to hospital. Joe asks if she can go to the hospital with this woman and she's told by the police, no, you can't. Just go home. Just go home and wait for an update. Again, that's the point. I'd be fucking furious. I would be fucking ready to kill someone. <laughs> I'd be like, I need to go to the hospital because I need the story. <laughs> I need the story. <laughs> so. Joe's at home. And she's waiting. Sort of odd, I guess, to be waiting for an update on a stranger's condition. You don't know, but I guess you want closure at that point. You've been such a part of it now, you need to know what happened. Now a week passes and they don't hear anything. Joe hears not a word. Until there is a knock on the door and it's the same police officer who was there at the side of the river when Joe pulled the woman out. And she's here to tell Joe exactly why that woman ended up in that state. The young woman whose life Joe saved that day was driving through that part of the world on her way to visit her family when she had been in a minor car crash. Now, it was nothing serious. It was a bump. Her car had been bumped hours before. Nothing major. Just a few hours before Joe had found her at the side of the road, the car had been through just a tiny little bump. Except what no one knew was that that tiny bump, that small crash, had actually given that woman a head injury. And she had banged her head and had begun to suffer from bleeding of the brain. And she was actually in the early stages of a stroke when Joe found her, which is why her behavior had been so strange. As that day had gone on, police were able to piece together that the reason she turned the engine on was in an attempt to drive herself to a hospital, but the brain injury had actually affected her motor skills and so she couldn't actually drive the car. Beyond this, the young woman remembers that she did get out of the car and that she started to walk. But why or how she ended up in the river, she has absolutely no idea. The next thing she knew, she was waking up in the hospital. For her, it went from, I'm going to get out of this car and I'm going to try and walk somewhere to I'm waking up in the hospital so none of that getting into the river none of that was was in her brain she didn't 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 have any any memory any recollection of any of that the reason for the mysterious address of the farm written down was because her family had written it down in a series of directions as one of those, if you reach this farm, you've gone in the wrong direction and you need to turn around. That was all that was. No mystery. 
She says, I am so grateful to Joe for stopping in the first place, but also for not letting it go. I would be dead if she had gone home and forgotten about me. Joe says, I think it was luck or fate or whatever you want to call it that made me see her that day. I often run through the roller coaster that was that event, but I'm euphoric that we found her and that she is alive. The young woman who suffered the brain injury went on to make a fairly amazing recovery. She suffered some paralysis down the side of her face and her motor skills are still not 100% but she's alive. She is alive and it's thanks to Joe that she is. And that's why if you ever see someone and you think it doesn't look right and you think that person might need your help, just stick your nose in. (laughs) Don't hesitate. Don't even hesitate for a second. Just fucking get involved. Because you might just save someone's life. Alright, on to story two. Take your mind from the winter in the English countryside to Bangladesh in the same year, 2013. And to the capital of Bangladesh. Right, I'll give you 10 points if you can name me the capital of Bangladesh. Mm, It rhymes with... Parka? No, hang on, it doesn't really rhyme with Parka. (laughs) It rhymes with... It doesn't really rhyme with anything. (laughs) It's called Dhaka. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I thought it was going to rhyme with lots of things. It turns out it doesn't. So, Dhaka, Bangladesh, a very, very industrial place. Thousands upon thousands of office buildings. I mean, much like any major, major capital, it's really busy. It's crammed full of people working, living, going about their lives. Now, the man that we need to know about in this story is called Didar Hossein. Didar worked in a factory which he had worked in for many, many years. It was a garment factory. So, factory making different bits of clothing and yeah, he'd worked there for years. He was in his early 30s in 2013. So, that this was his job. Now, was this a good job? Well, no, not really. It was very, very poorly paid. He was earning in a month the equivalent of $70. And that was for working uh, 40 hours a week. But what it meant was that Didar could provide for his family. So the fact that he works in, it's, it's a big, high, massive, huge, tall building. And it looks down over one of the main squares in the capital, Dhaka. So, Didar is 
at work one day. It's one o'clock in the afternoon. He's working away. And all of a sudden he hears, and as does everyone around him here, the most incredible crashing sound. And so everybody races to the windows to see what the hell is this sound? What the hell is this? And they look out the windows and they see that the building opposite is collapsing. It's falling down on itself. So the building in question was the Rana Plaza, an eight storey factory building opposite where Didar worked and disaster had struck. This building was just collapsing. Structurally, it hadn't been sound. Now, without getting into all the ins and outs of it, apparently the company who owned the building, they knew that it wasn't structurally sound, but they did fuck all about it. And they just kept their workers going into it all the time. And the day came when the building just, that was it, had enough, and it collapsed. You might remember the images of this on the news. I certainly remember seeing them because it is catastrophic what happened. I mean, it is absolutely terrible. You're talking about a huge nine-storey, massive, wide building collapsing right in the middle of a capital city. It's absolutely oh, devastating. So there's thousands of people on the street and there's all the people inside the building. So this is where Didar is. He's, he's the man we need to know in this story. He's watching this from the building that he is in. And his first instinct is to run out and try to start to help people. He wants to just pull people from the rubble. He wants to get people to safety. Now, when he gets to the bottom floor of his own factory, he's told, no, you're not allowed to go outside. There's too much happening at the moment. This could be really dangerous. But Didar goes, nah. Know what? I'm just going to go anyway. And he pushes out into the street. And it's just chaos. You can imagine it. It's just absolute chaos. This building, it's still falling down. There are people all over the streets. It's just horrific. So he approaches the building. And he finds a very, very small tunnel in the rubble. And Dadar says this. As a human being, I felt it was my duty to try and help other human beings. When I first went in through that tunnel, I saw dead bodies and I was frightened but I gathered up my courage and I went on one of the first things that he comes across and if you are particularly squeamish or if you're <laughs> eating food <laughs> right now or anything you may not enjoy this but fuck it it is what it is one of the first things that he sees is a woman who has been decapitated. And this is what he does. He drags her body out through the little tunnel into the street. And when he's asked later why, he says this. Because in that split second, I thought... Whether she has a head or not, someone is going to be looking 
for that body. So Didar re-enters the carnage and I mean essentially what he's doing at this point is he's just pushing his way through to find people. He says, I was very frightened, obviously. It was dangerous. But if I had stopped to think about it for a second, then I would never have been able to help anyone. What he sees as he gets further and further in is that he sees that there are people who are trapped inside. They're alive, but they are terrified to move. So they're just, they're completely trapped in that thing because they're going, if I move, more of this might fall on me or, you know, they're, they're also in shock. They don't know what to do. So... He's seeing these people, and so what he does is he crawls back outside and he starts asking people for help to help him find any kind of equipment which might help him make space to get people out. So there's lots of scrambling around, there's lots of ru people running around, but eventually people bring him some hammers they bring him sort of anything, really, that can help him shift a little bit of the rubble. So Didar manages to start pulling people out of the rubble and to safety. He brings people out one by one. Now, sometimes that's dragging them. Sometimes that's carrying them. He puts people on his back. Now, I'm just going to say at this point, right, <laughs> just so you've got a clear picture... Dadar is not, he's not the biggest guy in the world. So he's maybe about, I don't know, about five foot eight, height wise. But he's, he's quite a skinny guy. So when I'm telling you this, don't picture some huge, big guy. He really, really isn't. So he's doing his best to pull people out one by one. And he's starting to get really exhausted by bringing people out. And he goes and he says, look, can I get some rope? So someone outside, they find him some rope. He goes back in. And what he does is he ties the rope around himself. And when he finds someone that he can get to safety, he attaches the rope to them and then he walks just forward and essentially it's just dragging people out to safety. Dadar's only halfway through this and he's already saved 21 people from inside that disaster. But he is about to face even bigger challenge than he could have imagined in that moment. Right, buckle up your seatbelts everyone, this is going to get a wee bit uh, gory and a bit graphic, but it's so good. As he goes back in to the tunnel, he sees a girl about aged 19 and she is trapped under some fallen bricks and she's hurt really badly. So he goes to her and he tries to pull her out. But he realises that her hand has been trapped by some falling bricks. And as he tries and tries to pull her, he can't. Her hand is weighted down with these bricks and she cannot be freed She's screaming in pain and she says to him, please, please save me, even if it means cutting off my hand. And he says, look, let me just keep trying and I can, I can get you out of here. Just let me keep trying. So with his rope, he ties the rope to her 
and he tries to move forward, but he cannot get her to move. She says, just cut my hand off. And so Dadar goes outside and he finds a doctor amongst the hundreds of ambulances and the police that have now arrived and he explains the situation. Now, this doctor that he finds, what a fucking knob lord. And this doctor says, no, I don't want to go in. I'm too afraid. Great. Brilliant. That's just what you, what you want to hear in a state of emergency from a doctor. No, sorry, I'm a bit scared. I don't really want to. I mean, I get that, okay? You don't really want to go in and rescue... Your, but fuck's sake. What he does is he... <laughs> this doctor, he gives Didar a knife and some anaesthetic. And he says... If you need to go in there and perform an amputation, then go and just do it. So, in complete shock, he returns. He gets back to the girl and he says, OK, I'm going to get you out of here, but I will have to cut your hand off. And she's pleading, please do it, please just do it, because otherwise I am not getting out of here. And so he gives her the anaesthetic and then he begins to cut at her wrist. He says the anaesthetic was in her hand so she was conscious and could talk. She watched while I amputated her hand. She was screaming and I was screaming too. And I cried when I saw how much pain she was in. I felt bad, but there was no other way. After the amputation, he tied her body to his body and then started to crawl out of the tunnel. He shifted slowly, slowly with this girl and eventually he got her out and then she was taken away in an ambulance. Now, was the experience over for Didar? No, it wasn't. He goes back in and just before this ordeal will be over, he would carry out two more amputations in order to release people. Oh, God. He cuts through one man's leg in order to save him. Now, Didar tries to actually talk the man out of it. He's saying to him, I can, I can try anything else. I can try moving the rubble around you. And the man says, no, this is the, the only way I'm going to get out is if you cut my leg off. Imagine actually having to, with no medical training, you, you know, you work in a garment factory and you are now having to cut a man's leg off. Fucking hell. Anyway, he gets that man out. There's another guy in there who says, please cut my foot off in order to free me. But by this point, this is horrific. There's no anaesthetic left. The Dars used it all and he can't find a doctor who will give him anaesthetic. So he has to cut the man's foot off with no anaesthetic. And the entire time, the guy is screaming in pain, but also begging for him not to stop. Oh my God. Oh. So... With his rope still tied around him, Didar pulls another ten bodies out of that rubble, making the total number of people that he saved that day 34 people he pulled 
from that absolute devastation. You know, it's just... How, <laughs> how often can you ever say that a stranger risked their own life to save 34 people that they didn't know? Didar tried to go back in and get more, but police, they wouldn't let him. So he went home that night and he told his family of what he had experienced. And the next day he got up and he went to work as usual. In the next few weeks he searched long and hard for the girl whose hand that he had cut off. He desperately wanted to know that she had survived, that she'd lived. And now eventually he found her. He found her by going from hospital to hospital and just giving a description until he found her. He then says, and I get this because it must be weird. He then says, it felt so strange going into her hospital room because he was thinking, why, why am I here? It was like his brain was going, I just need to know she's alive. When he gets to her room, she looks up from the bed and she bursts into tears. And her mum and dad are in the room and she starts shouting, that's the man, that's the man who saved me. And her parents, they run towards the door and they are crying and they're hugging him and they're shaking his hand and they're thanking him. Every one of the 34 people that Didar pulled from that disaster lived thanks to him. He says, afterwards I was ill for a couple of days. I couldn't eat anything and I had vocal problems. My family told me to rest or go to the doctor but I said I just needed sleep, but I couldn't sleep, not for days. Whenever I started to fall asleep, I felt like someone was calling my name. I have a lot of memories, particularly about the hand and the foot being amputated and the dead bodies that I couldn't save. They haunt me. I never thought I was a hero. I still don't. I'm just an ordinary person trying to help and I'm grateful to God that I could help them in any way that I could. And so ends the story. And all right, a little third story for you. Just because, you know, all good things come in threes. Three turtle doves. <laughs> Three is the magic number. Three little pegs. Three sums. <laughs> Kidding. <laughs> okay, I've got one very short but definitely extraordinary story. So it's 1999 and it's just outside of New York and a nurse called Penny Brown is working her shift at the hospital. Now, Penny is, she's a bit annoyed because her son is playing a baseball game not too far away and what she really wants to do is go and watch her son play baseball. Fine, fair enough. Now, it's not the busiest night in the hospital. So, look, she goes to her fellow nurses and she says, My son is playing a game of baseball 
I'd really like to go. And they say, all right, Penny, of course. On you go. Fair enough. So off she goes. So she gets to the game. Fine, fine, fine. She's watching the game when an accident happens on the pitch. Now her son is only around 10, 11 years old. So his teammates, you know, they're all that sort of 10, 11 age. When someone in her son's team accidentally hits, he raises the bat and he hits it off the chest of another boy in the team. Not Penny's son, just a stranger. But this 10 year old boy has been whacked in the chest with this bat. And I mean like a proper, proper hit. Not like a, you've had the wind knocked out of you, but like an, oh fuck, that was like a serious hit to the chest. So this 10 year old boy, his name is Kevin. He collapses from being hit. The impact of that hit had made 10 year old Kevin go into cardiac arrest. Fucking hell. Just from the accidental hit with the bat. So there's panic, there's screaming, there's people on the field shouting for ambulances and Penny rushes into the situation. Now she's a nurse, after all. And what happens is she starts CPR on Kevin. So she's pressing on his chest. She's breathing in his mouth. And by the time the ambulance gets there, he is stable and he's fine. Penny never really sees the outcome of the act from that night, she's simply told by paramedics that she has saved this boy's life. Seven years later, Kevin, of the former, had a cardiac arrest where Penny saved him. He is 21 years old and he's working in a restaurant as a waiter. So, He's working here while he studies sports and it's a fairly typical Tuesday night. Typical until this. There are a group of people in for a meal when all of a sudden there is a commotion at the table of guests and people are like frantically shouting, screaming, like what the hell's going on? What, what's happening? Well, one of the guests has begun to choke and she's fallen to the floor. Now, one of the members of the party, they're attempting to help her, but they're shouting, she's choking to death. Help her. So 21-year-old Kevin, he runs full on into the situation. He picks up the woman and he begins the Heimlich manoeuvre. You know that one where you sort of grab someone from behind? The one that, <laughs> well, either looks like you're trying to, like, kill someone from behind or, like, <laughs> you know, shag someone from behind. I don't know. Anyway, that one, that one just looks really weird <clears throat> when you're, like, it, that in someone's chest. Anyway, whatever Kevin does, it works. Whatever had been lodged in her body comes out and she's saved. Well, who was this woman? that was joking. Well, it was none other than Penny Brown, the nurse who had saved him years earlier when he had had a cardiac arrest on the baseball field. How incredible, but also bizarre, but yet slightly wonderful. In the space of 10 years, these two strangers had saved each other's lives. When just by simply being there in the moment when they needed it. And so that is just the end of that wee tiny, tiny short story. <laughs>
All right. <laughs> I'm out of here. I hope that you have enjoyed these three stories. And always remember, if there is a stranger in trouble, help them out. Because you also might just be that stranger who needs help. And I would love to think that if any of you were in any kind of trouble or needed anyone's help, that somebody would come and help you. Alright, I hope you enjoyed these stories. Okay, until the next episode, goodbye. It didn't, it didn't affect me really one way or the other. <laughs> <laughs>
without joy it's cold it'll be cold so cold without you to hold this christmas nailed it I don't want a lot for Christmas There's just one thing I need Don't care about those presents Underneath the Christmas tree I just want you for my own More than you could ever know Make my wish come true All I want for Christmas is you. Why is it so slow? You, you. And I don't want a lot for Christmas. There is just one thing I need. I don't care about the presents underneath your Christmas tree. I don't care, Santa, Santa, to the North Pole and Saint Nick. I just wanna see my baby standing right outside my door. I just want you for my own, more than you could ever know. Make my wish come true. All I want for Christmas is you, ooh, ooh, baby. Alfie, shush. Let's get it on. Let's do it. Let's get it over.